Thank you very much. That was an incredibly kind uh, introduction. I'm not sure I deserve it, but I really do appreciate being invited to come here to talk. I think this is my third year here, and I've enjoyed every single moment I've uh, been here. This is a wonderful place, and I appreciate you all for being here as well. So I'm going to talk about metastatic prostate cancer. Um, <clears throat> I do research in genital urinary malignancies, specifically in prostate and bladder cancer. Uh, but one of the major issues that faces our field is with all the new agents in prostate cancer that are FDA approved and leading to survival benefit, you know, there's not a clear right or way to sequence these drugs. And uh, what I'm going to tell you today is I, I kind of put it in a logical order of how I think about sequencing these agents. It's not that there's one absolute correct way, but uh, I hope I can convince you that at least uh, my logic makes some sense. So <clears throat> I'll get started here with my disclosures. And I will be addressing some non-regulatory approved uh, therapies in this presentation, and I'll emphasize that when I get to those slides. <clears throat> so here are the discussion topics. I'm going to talk about new treatments for castration-sensitive disease, so hormone-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer, uh, immunotherapy as well, some sec second-generation AR-targeted agents like abiraterone and zalutamide, chemotherapy, obviously, radiopharmaceuticals, and considerations for sequencing these agents, uh, practical considerations, since we don't have definitive data as to the right way to do things in regards to survival outcomes, we have to think about things like toxicity, patient comorbidities, and just pragmatic issues. And then some potential novel biomarkers. Uh, we used to talk about ARV7 some. Uh, we're going to probably focus more on next generation sequencing now since so many people are ordering sequencing panels. And then some emerging therapeutics. So I've built ARS questions in throughout this, and I'm just going to start with the first question for you guys to go ahead and enter in your thoughts. This is a 68-year-old gentleman who had low back pain and presents to his primary care physician. He gets imaging studies with radiographs, and they show osteoblastic lesions in the lumbar spine. Uh, PSA is checked because it's blastic, and we know that prostate cancer is uh, interesting in that it's predominantly blastic bone metastases. And um, <clears throat> what ends up happening is a PSA is checked, and it's 110. They get an MRI to rule out core compression, and there is no core compression, and then eventually staging leads to a bone scan that shows more than 10 lesions in the thoracic and lumbar spine, pelvis, and bilateral humeri. CT reveals no soft tissue disease, and what do you treat this patient with? Okay, so this is a cool format here. Uh, it's, uh, so options are an LHRH agnus alone, bicludamide followed, uh, first followed by an LHRH agonist, Bicalutamide first followed by LHRH agonist in six cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy, and bicalutamide first followed by LHRH uh, agonist, and I'm sorry you can't read it, in six cycles of docetaxel with prednisone, five milligrams POBID. Oops. Well, these are the options anyhow, so why don't you guys go ahead and select... Is there any music or anything, or do we just give people time? I was expecting, yeah? Yeah? So I'm supposed to install an app? <laughs> All right. Well, why don't I do this? Then we'll just, I'll blast through these slides, and I'll move on to my slide. And if we don't have the ARS system up in place, I'm going to ask you guys to raise your hands then. Is that all right? Can we do that? Sure. All right, let's do that then. So who votes for LHRH agonist alone? And I'm going to penalize you guys if you don't raise your hands, OK? I don't know what I'm going to come up with something. Number two is bicludamide first fall by an LHRH agonist. Who likes that option? Nobody. All right. How about number three? Biclutamide first followed by LHRH agonists in six cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy. All right. We have a couple takers there. And number four is biclutamide followed by six cycles of docetaxel with prednisone 5 BID. And we have a few more takers there. And, you know, I have to say that 90% of the room did not answer. <laughs> so, you know, don't be shy here. There's I'm only going to penalize you if you don't answer. It doesn't matter if you answer right or wrong, OK? Anyhow, I don't think th four is incorrect, but number three is what I would do. And here's the reason why. You first have to give a bi biclutamide as an AR blocker so you prevent the <coughs> testosterone flare because you're giving an LHRH agonist. And this is a boards type of question. 
You don't want to give an LHRH agonist and flare somebody's pain or cause urinary obstruction with somebody as the testosterone could go up first before it goes down. So you need to have that biclutamide there first. Then you give an LHRH agonist. And then the question is, what about six cycles of dose tax? And we'll go through that data here later. Uh, but the prednisone plus minus, really, I mean, for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, the studies were done with 5 milligrams BID of prednisone. For hormone-sensitive disease, there are two studies, one charted and one stampede, and I'll go through that data, but charted was done actually with no prednisone. Stampede was done with prednisone. They both showed a survival benefit. I'm not sure what the steroids add, so I do it in this setting without prednisone but it's fine to do it with prednisone. Here's the data from Charted, okay? So this was a large randomized controlled trial done, led by ECOG, Chris Sweeney and ECOG, 790 patients. And at the planned interim analysis, there was a dramatic, dramatic survival benefit, uh, okay? And so these patients had metastatic prostate cancer, and initially it was meant to accrue just high volume disease patients, but eventually they did accrue some low volume disease patients to try to help facilitate accrual to the study. And what is high volume versus low volume disease? High volume disease is four or more bony metastases with at least one outside the axial skeleton. Anything in the appendicular skeleton counts, all right? Humerus, femur, ribs, anything outside of the vertebral column or the pelvis counts as appendicular, okay? And the reason this data, many people have forgotten this, but way back, I think in 1990 or so, there was a New England Journal paper using flutamide plus LHRH therapy versus LHRH therapy alone. And it showed there was no survival benefit, but the reason it got New England Journal paper is they had some prognostic modeling and showed that this breakdown of high versus low volume disease uh, showed a difference in prognosis. That's all it took to get a New England Journal paper back in the Stone Ages. But that being said and done, now the bar is a lot higher. All right, so the high volume disease, there's a very, very clear survival benefit. It's a 17 month, 18 month survival benefit at median, which is dramatic in oncology. Let's be honest, most survival benefits are three, four months, sometimes only a couple months. But for low volume disease, there was no survival benefit. And I'll just say that this could have been underpowered. Uh, these patients also live longer, do better, because they have you know better prognosis. So you know, this was a, a subgroup that was added in later, and although the recommendations are don't treat patients with low volume disease with docetaxel, I don't think it's exactly wrong. I think it's a discussion to be had, but there is no definitive benefit for that setting, okay? This guy obviously, case had high volume disease because he had 10 or more bone metastases and bilateral humeri metastases. So the treatment with docetaxel would have been very appropriate for that patient. Now here's the UK study. And this study allowed patients with metastatic prostate cancer and also patients that had M0 disease. And it was a mix, patients with high risk localized disease after surgery, patients who had lymph node positive disease found at surgery, people with biochemical recurrence and PSA doubling times less than six months. But as you can see here, overall, the study population showed a survival benefit and a median of about 10 months survival benefit of docetaxel being added on. And here's the 61% who just had metastatic disease. Okay, so 39% had M0, 61% had metastatic disease, and you can see it's almost a two-year survival benefit, okay? So this is rather, rather dramatic. And in this study, as I mentioned, they did use some steroids, whereas in the U.S. study, they did not use steroids, but there's survival benefit either way. The thing to look at in this study is you might extrapolate and say the overall patient population had a survival benefit, hence should we be giving docetaxel to those with biochemically recurrent disease, with M0 disease? And I'm hesitant. If you do the subgroup analyses, you see on the forest plots that for M1 disease, it falls far to the left of the forest plots, clear benefit, but for M0 disease, the middle of your bar there falls right on a hazard ratio of 1. So for this population, <laughs> I'd be hesitant to give docetaxel. So I think the definitive is for high volume disease, give docetaxel. You can give docetaxel for low volume disease is a question mark. And for M0 disease, I probably wouldn't do it. All right. Now, the world has changed recently with latitude and another uh, subset of a stampede being presented just at ASCO this last year. And they were published in the New England Journal just about a month and a half, two months ago. And Latitude was a study that took patients with what they called high-risk disease, which had metastatic disease and a Gleason score of eight or greater, three or more bone lesions on bone scan, and present or presence of visceral lesions. Now, I have to tell you that 
This was interestingly designed because if you look at these criteria, this is probably about 80% of people who present with metastatic prostate cancer. So how high risk is it? It's, you know, not that high risk. It's most patients who present with metastatic prostate cancer. But you can see a rather dramatic survival benefit. The control arm did not <coughs> reach um, uh, the median yet. But you can see that, again, there's a survival benefit to giving abiraterone. They were on that for about a median of over of three years or so. Um, so that's uh, also a very, very significant survival benefit there. Of course, it'd be nice to have a comparison with docetaxel, but we don't. Now, this is another arm of Stampede, and they also took their patients and con had control with ADT and had ADT plus abiraterone acetate and also showed a significant benefit. If you look at the survival curves and the hazard ratios, again, you can't compare one randomized control trial to another, but it doesn't look that much difference than how much benefit you get with docetaxel. So I think this is really actually quite interesting. But here's what I find to be the most interesting point. <clears throat> In this arm of Stampede, almost half the patients had M0 disease. They were those patients with biochemical recurrence and short PSA doubling times. They were the patients who had lymph node positive disease at the time of surgery. <clears throat> and if you look here, the graphs are a little bit different, but the hazard ratio of one, um, Let's see if there's a laser pointer here. Hazard ratio of one is here. And I find this interesting that even though it crosses, the forest plot crosses the hazard ratio of one there, eh, it's really the edge of, the, of this 95% confidence interval. Um, and keep in mind that these are patients that have M0 disease. So my extrapolation is if you had low volume disease, low volume metastatic disease, you're probably gonna get benefit from abiraterone words. It's not clear with docetaxel. If you have M0 disease, I'm even considering it in patients who have really high-risk characteristics. I'm not doing it for people who had surgery and high-risk characteristics at surgery. Some of those patients might be cured. But some patients, if they have a PSA doubling time that's like three months and it's rising real fast, you know, I might consider doing it there if your third-party payers will allow it. So, uh, but that being said and done, the overall population was significant. So here's my summary for this data is it's not clear that we should treat M0 patients just yet. But again, as I said, I might consider abiraterone for those with high risk features, and I consider those with the PSA doubling times that are really short. I would treat low volume metastatic disease patients with abiraterone. And for high volume disease patients, I'd offer either abiraterone or docetaxel and use practical things to consider which ones. Patient comorbidities. There are certain comorbidities that are going to be better for abiraterone versus docetaxel and vice versa, side effect profiles. Duration of therapy. That is one thing to think about. There are some patients who are like, I don't want to take extra pills for another three years. I'd rather just take six doses of chemotherapy. And there's other patients who are deathly afraid of chemotherapy. So these are the types of things to think about. And the financial toxicity. Docetaxel is off patent. It's generic. It's not very expensive. Abiraterone. Not off patent, rather expensive. So that being said and done, <clears throat> some patients, you know, are going to lean one way or another. I just have this active conversation with them if they have high volume disease. All right. There's no data for adding abiraterone many months later. So this question comes up a lot. Oh, I gave them ADT, or I gave them ADT and docetaxel, and now it's like six, seven, eight months, nine, ten months down the road, and their PSA is undetectable. Does that mean I should add abiraterone now? Well, in these studies, you really had about a three-month window from the LHRH therapy to abiraterone. They kind of fall into never-never land, and I'm not sure what to do with them, so I'm not doing it because I don't have the data for it. And I would emphasize that we should keep enrolling on clinical trials. Most new studies in this disease state will allow for prior docetaxel, then add on their new novel AR-targeted therapy, like enzalutamide or apalutamide, these sorts of things. So they kind of allow for a combination of these sorts of things. So that's why we should continue to enroll on clinical trials in this setting. All right? So here's ARS question number two. We're moving on. Your 68-year-old patient receives androgen deprivation therapy, six cycles of docetaxel. PSA goes undetectable. Patients just maintain on ADT alone for the next two years. Then the PSA starts to slowly rise, 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 1.2 over a six-month period. Testosterone is castrated, so you've now demonstrated metastatic, castration-resistant prostate cancer. He's asymptomatic. What do you do now? <clears throat> Enzalutamide. Anybody like enzalutamide? Asymptomatic metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. People hate enzalutamide here. Or people just hate answering. <laughs> Cipula cell T. Anybody like Cipula cell T? 
Okay, we got one who's kind of like, uh, maybe. <clears throat> How about abiraterone and prednisone? All right, we have about five, six, seven, eight takers. So you, you would give Sapul cell T and abiraterone, looks like. <laughs> All right, dose of cell prednisone here. <clears throat> and then radium 223. All right, so I would say that the only wrong answer here. Okay, people, somebody shout it out. What's the one wrong answer here? Yes, okay, because for radium-223, you must have symptomatic disease, bone metastat, symptomatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, radium-223, very good. Any of the others are reasonable, okay? Um, any of the others are reasonable, but I probably wouldn't lead in with dose of taxol first because for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, it has pain palliative benefit and survival benefit, but it's a median two month survival benefit. It's not nearly as dramatic when you give it earlier, okay? So I tend to save it a little bit later for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. <clears throat> However, um, in this setting, I try to think about things like immunotherapy first. And there's a reason why, because there's a short window of opportunity for immunotherapy. All right, you have to have asymptomatic metastatic CRPC. You have to have reasonably indolent disease. The survival curves don't split until the six month time point. And only one to 3% have a significant PSA decline. You can't see it working, all right? There's no improvement in progression for your survival, no real drop in PSA, but this is a type of agent that takes a while to really work. So you have to have somebody, and I, I view it this way, I tell patients, I have to think that you have the type of disease that can hang out for about six months and not do too much to then gain benefit because the only way this can lead to a survival benefit without inducing any sort of remissive type of state is, is that it slows the disease down and it slows the disease progression down later. On a clinical trial, you image them every three months, oh, almost everybody progresses. But the only way this can lead to a survival benefit is there's benefit later that you just can't detect right up front on a clinical trial. And that's believable with immunotherapy, especially this type of immunotherapy, okay? So you form an antigen-presenting cell that has to educate your adaptive immune system. This is not a PD-1, PD-L1 antibody that might work more acutely right away. This requires an educative process, so it makes sense with how it works, all right? Now, who do I, how do I select those patients? <clears throat> it's hard to select those patients, but you have to look at the patient's course. Is their PSA rising real fast? Do they have a ton of bone metastases or not? And one way to do it is based on baseline PSA as a surrogate marker kind of, of disease volume. So there was this analysis that broke down the baseline PSA into tertiles. And as you can see here, the group that did the best had the biggest difference between CYP-T in the impact trial versus control. Hazard ratio 0.51 were those with the lowest PSA quartile, less than 22. Fortunately, the highest PSA quartile, they still had a hazard ratio 0.84, but this is the only group, again, statistically underpowered, but the, and again, a post hoc analysis, but this is the only group where the hazard ratio did not cross one at all. So I try to focus to get, treat my patients like this, who are just becoming castration resistant, not super high volume disease, and treat them with Sapula cell T. If they have much higher volume disease, PSA is rising fast, a little bit of symptoms, a little bit of pain, that sort of thing, higher PSA at the time I discover this, I'm going to skip Sapula cell T. All right, so there's a window of opportunity, and this is where I view it. Okay? <clears throat> Again, disclosure, this is all my thoughts. There's no definitive data for any of this. Now, of course, if the patient didn't fit, fit those criteria, I would probably move on to use abiraterone here. And if a patient receives Sapula cell T and starts to progress, then I would use abiraterone. And this was FDA approved in this setting. There was first a post chemotherapy study, Cougar 301, that was positive. And then Cougar 302 had pro dual primary endpoints of radiographic progression free survival, very positive here and overall survival, and even though the interim analysis was early and they allowed crossover for the control arm, they still were able to show a significant overall survival benefit at the final analysis, okay? So this would be kind of my next agent that I would reach for, or my first agent if the patient wasn't a good uh, Sapula cell T candidate, all right? Now, what about enzalutamide? <clears throat> There's no definitive data showing abiraterone and enzalutamide are better than one another, and if you look at this, Enzalutamide, again, was FDA approved by the FIRM trial in the post-chemotherapy setting, but in the pre-chemotherapy setting, they also had a significant benefit. Here's the radiographic progression-free survival benefit. It looks more dramatic than abiraterone, right? It's only that way because the control arm was true placebo. 
In the abiraterone studies, the control arm was prednisone 5-BID, and we know from old data that prednisone has activity in this disease. Maybe 20 percent have a significant PSA decline to prednisone alone. So this was a true inactive control, whereas in the prednisone studies, they had an active control. <clears throat> and then overall survival benefit there as well in the PREVAIL trial with enzalutamide versus placebo. All right, so which should go first? If you're, okay, let's say you've given CIPT, now you're deciding between abiraterone and enzalutamide. <clears throat> there are some practical considerations because there's no efficacy difference. With abiraterone, there are side effects. Transaminitis in about 10, 11 percent of patients. Fluid excess, because why? It's a CYP17 lyase inhibitor. You can convert cholesterol in the tumor all the way down to androgens. And what does this do? This blocks CYP17 lyase and it shunts away from androgen production, shunts towards mineralocorticoid production, de deoxycorticosterone. So you can get <clears throat> retention of sodium, fluid retention, edema, hypertension, hypokalemia, all those sorts of things. That's why we give the prednisone to tell the brain, stop making ACTH, stop pushing down that pathway. But with prednisone, you can get hyperglycemia, wound healing concerns if you just had a surgery. Low dose of prednisone, however, usually 5 milligrams BID, although clearly 5 milligrams Q-day is safe as well. Enzalutamide, you have to worry about seizures and people at high risk for seizures, okay? People that have had a lot of strokes, let's say. <clears throat> but the most common side effect is fatigue, and especially with elderly patients. And I'm not going to define elderly. All right, <clears throat> I'll let you guys define what elderly is. <clears throat> but there was this interesting crossover randomized controlled trial recently, <clears throat> and I'm losing my voice a little bit there. <clears throat> but what it is, is, is it was patients were randomized to abiraterone versus enzalutamide, and then crossed over to, if you had abiraterone first, you got enzalutamide second. If you had enzalutamide first, you'd cross over to abiraterone second. The efficacy data came out, and it's not really any different, okay? But there is interesting kind of quality of life data. And they did these Montreal cognitive testing assessments and depression severity testing. And there was not a statistically significant difference in cognitive impairment, or, but there almost was in favor of abiraterone over enzalutamide. And changes in depression, there was statistically significant difference. There was a difference. Whereas it was worse with enzalutamide than it was with abiraterone. And here's all the depression questions that we ask, right? <clears throat> Remember back in med school, all the questions we're taught to ask. The big difference was psychomotor disabilities. And that makes some sense because as a side effect of enzalutamide, it does cross the blood-brain barrier. It increase, decreases the seizure threshold. And you can see basically things like restless leg syndrome, some psychomotor disabilities. There's increased number of falls, these sorts of things. Now, enzalutamide is a great drug, and I'm just basically splitting hairs here. But when you're a clinician, you have to decide which, how, which hair to split and which drug you'd go with first or second. This helps me out, okay? So there are probably are slightly better side effect profile with abiraterone than with enzalutamide, probably, all right? Now, question three. This is a 65-year-old gentleman with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer who receives abiraterone, okay, with a good PSA response for one year. His PSA rises from undetectable to 8.4 over a three-month period, but he remains asymptomatic as restaging scans remain completely stable with more than 20 bone-only metastases. What do you do now? Radium-223, who wants that? <clears throat> Docetaxone prednisone, who wants that? All right, we have some takers, three or four takers. Enzalutamide. All right, we have about three takers. It's pretty even, okay? So here's what I would do. Now, he's asymptomatic, but I would lean towards docetaxone. Here's why. Here's the breakdown of sequencing data. This is all retrospective data of patients who received abiraterone after enzalutamide or enzalutamide after abiraterone. And as you can see, the response rate's not so great, okay? Not super, super great. I generally think of abiraterone after enzalutamide as about 10% response rates, enzalutamide after abiraterone about 30% response rates, but not phenomenal here. So for that reason, in this setting, I tell patients, you probably have a better chance of responding to docetaxel than you do of switching from one hormone agent to another. Now, some patients don't want it. They want to take, they feel great. They want to take a pill, and that's fine. I'm willing to do that, but I do recommend that they more strongly consider docetaxel than switching hormonal, back-to-back -back hormonal agents. Question four, you discussed docetaxel versus enzalutamide with this patient, and he wanted to delay chemotherapy. 
So he chose enzalutamide, and I'm not going to be upset at the patient about it. I get it. So his PSA continues to rise. It's up to 25.3 after three months of enzalutamide. So he's not responding. He's now starting to get right thigh pain. He's using ibuprofen, 800 to 1,600 milligrams a day. Restaging scans show diffuse osteoblastic bone lesion super scan. No soft tissue metastases. What do you do now? Radium-223, any takers? All right, I have about five takers, six, seven, eight takers. Okay, this is probably the most uniformity I've seen yet. Dose of taxol on prednisone. All right, I have maybe three takers there. Cabazzi taxol on prednisone. Nobody. What's the only wrong answer here? Scream it out. What's the only wrong answer? Somebody, somebody tell us. It's cabazitaxel, right? It's only FDA-approved post-dose of taxel chemotherapy. Now, maybe this guy had received dose of taxel for hormone-sensitive disease, then you could use it there. But really, I mean, I think here I would use radium-223, all right? It's not wrong to use dose of taxel. It's totally fine. But I would use radium-223 here because the Alsimka's trial results showed an overall survival benefit. There was also prevention of skeletal-related events, bone pain decrease. Uh, there was some there as well. Pre or post dose attacks, so it worked out. So half the patients were pre, half the patients were post. Survival benefit both pre or post. So you can use it pre dose attack, so you don't have to give dose attacks all first. And here's my practical reasons. So you know, FDA approved for patients lacking visceral metastases. The later you wait in the disease course, the more likely you are to have visceral metastases. Insurance companies care about these things. ANC greater than 1,500, subsequent greater than 1,000, hemoglobin greater than 10, platelet count greater than 100,000. Nobody's going to tell me I can't give IV dose of taxol to somebody whose platelet counts 44,000, but they will tell me I can't give radium-223. That happens later in the disease course, maybe because of prior chemotherapy, maybe just because of bone marrow involvement of prostate cancer. And so it's also very clear when you give it earlier, you're able to administer six doses, and there's benefit when you can get all the doses in. It's harder to get that in post-chemotherapy. So when I can, like this patient, I try to give radium-223 earlier. And there's clear data to show that myelosuppression issues are greater for patients who either have received prior dose of Taxol, have six or more METs, including SuperScan patients, have received prior radiation therapy for bone pain, and have a higher ALKFOS. All makes sense. More sites for radium-223 to sit down, more likely a myelosuppression. And of course, after radium-223, I'd give dose of Taxol. It'd be fine to give dose of Taxol here as well. You see, this is old data now when all the curves kind of come together, and yet there's still supposedly a survival benefit there. But there is. It's just the small survival benefit here. And then when you go post-dose of Taxol, you can now give Cabazitaxel. This was randomized to mitoxantrone and showed a median survival benefit in the post-dose of Taxol setting of Cabazitaxel over mitoxantrone. It's just a novel taxane that basically is a larger structure and repels from P glycoprotein, which is a resistant mechanism to taxanes. Recent data showing non-inferiority of overall survival for the lower doses of 20 milligrams per meter squared compared to 25 milligrams per meter squared and less grade 3, 4 AEs, okay, less toxicity with the lower dose but non-inferiority in terms of overall survival. And then there was this frontline trial that was a superiority trial that was negative because, as you can see, there was no superiority. But what it did teach us is against dose of Taxol, Cabazitaxel was actually the least toxic. Now, this is a messy slide, but trust me, there are less adverse events. There's not the edema issues. There's not the neuropathy issues. There's not the excessive teariness issues. So I'm not saying you should use cabazitaxel first line. You should still use it after docetaxel there. But what I am saying is we shouldn't be scared of cabazitaxel. The original data showed a 5% toxic death rate, 7.5% febrile neutropenia rate. But that was because there was no primary prophylaxis, and that was at 25 milligrams per meter squared. 20 milligrams per meter squared is very safe. Now, I'm getting near the end here, and I know I'm probably running a little over time. Some of it is because of the ARS issues there. It takes a little longer. But this is a 70-year-old gentleman, metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, has received all FDA-approved therapies. He's currently had eight cycles of cabazitaxel with disease stabilization. PSA remains at 7.5. Starts to get right upper quadrant pain. <clears throat> bone scan shows diffuse osteoblastic bone metastases. PSA, but CT scan shows multiple new liver metastases. LFTs are within normal limits. ECOG performance status is 1. PSA is really not rising. What do you do now? Perform a biopsy of an easily accessible metastatic lesion. Who likes that one? 
Okay, we have about four takers. Hospice. There's a couple. Continued cabazitaxel prednisone. There's a couple there for that too, okay? I would biopsy this patient. Here's the reason why. I consider a metastatic biopsy for patients with visceral lesions, extremely bulky lymph nodes, low PSA in the setting of high volume disease. This guy's PSA is not rising, but he's developed liver metastases or predominantly lytic rather than blastic bone metastases. Lytic lesions tend to be more small cell neuroendocrine phenotype, okay, rather than blastic. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for small cell. This may arise as a mechanism of resistance to androgen deprivation therapy. Low PSA is not a commonly perineal plastic syndromes, but you can get neuroendocrine markers like chromogranin A. That's what you look for on your immunohistochemistry, synaptophysin chromogranin A, and you treat with platinum doublets just like you would treat an extensive stage small cell patient. But the other thing we're looking for is next-gen sequencing. So we participate in stand-up to cancer, metastatic biopsies for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, 23% harbor DNA repair alterations, BRCA2 being most common, BRCA1, CHECK2, ATM, Paul B2, and Colin Pritchard from our center then did an analysis in patients with metastatic prostate cancers, found 12% of these patients had germline alterations. So not only implications for treatment, but for family genetic counseling and prevention of cancer, which is very, very important. And some would argue we should sequence everybody with metastatic disease because 12% incidence is quite high. Now, what's the implications for therapy? PARP inhibitors, we've talked about this, okay? So when you got homologous recombination deficiency, you get a single strand break, PARP can re re repair that. If you inhibit it with a PARP inhibitor, now you get, cell me you get toxic death and apoptosis to that cell. And the Laparib has been tested in the TOPARP trial in the New England Journal, showing 88% response rates in those patients who had a DNA repair deficiency, homologous recombination deficiency. Not a lot of responses in those that didn't. Here are select ongoing PARP inhibitor trials. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through that, but don't forget platinum. This is Heather Chang. She's a great junior investigator. She did this study with platinum chemotherapy and she has one ongoing now with platinum chemotherapy for those with ATM or BRCA mutated or any other DNA repair abnormality and showing some dramatic responses to platinum because it induces double strand break. Anything that induces double strand break should work, including in radium 223 for these patients, okay? So here's my summary slide, and I'm sorry I ran maybe about five minutes over, but docetaxel now abiraterone offers survival benefit for metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer patients. If you're going to use Sapulosel-T for immunotherapy, it should be early for metastatic CRBC, not later. There's no definitive data for sequencing or uh, differentiating between abiraterone and enzalutamide, but one tends to not work well after the other. Radium-223 can be considered for symptomatic bone metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and no visceral metastases, and you can consider it prior to docetaxel chemotherapy. It may be better that way. Cabazitaxel-20 is not inferior to 25, but much less toxic, and platinum chemotherapy has a role, both for neuroendocrine small cell variants and also for patients with homologous recombination deficiency. Thanks, and this is the one beautiful day every five years there in Seattle, where you can see Mount Rainier. Sorry for running a little over.